Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join uh, again. And uh, it's a, it's been a, a busy day, for, I know, working day for all of us. But uh, I just want to get right to, uh, get straight to the point uh, for our session today. And just to, um, just to make the most of our time together. But it only makes sense for me to proceed with the session today uh, by making some preface statements before uh, we launch into the lesson for today. And so uh, one of the points I wanted to make clear here today is why are we doing this? Why have we organized these series of sessions? Why should you be on this call as opposed to any other call or any other meeting that you can be at? And I just want to lay the ground for that, make the case for that, and uh, proceed with our content for today. Um, if I can ask you or, or, or raise this question here with you uh, before we proceed, the million dollar question for all of us is, do we have the kingdom mindset? And so most of us may answer the question as yes, but if you were anything like me, I thought for the first 10 years of my Christian life that I had the kingdom mindset. And then I realized that, nope, I don't have the kingdom mindset. I have more of a religious or a churchianity mindset. And I love this quote that you see on the screen here. Religion prepares man to leave the earth. The kingdom prepares man to dominate earth. And again, this is a very profound quote in the light of the fact that even now, uh, with all that's happening in the Middle East, with all the turmoil in the Middle East, a lot of the messaging that's coming out from many churches is, end time preaching, or oh, these are the signs of the times. And the church tends to lurch in that direction whenever there's any uh, hurricane or earthquake or any kind of war, any kind of those kind of situations. Um, you know, the church tends to swing towards, you know, Matthew 24 and the end time kind of preaching or the signs of the times and all of this, which is fine, which is great, nothing against that. But I spent the first 10 years of my Christian life listening to rapture-centric preaching. What I mean by rapture-centric preaching, most of the preaching that I heard during the first 10 years of my, 10 years of my Christian life was about, hey, Jesus is coming soon. Rapture is, is imminent. Be ready. Have your oil in your lamp. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. You don't want to miss the rapture. Be ready. Be ready. You don't want to miss the rapture. Be ready. Don't be attached to things of this world. Don't be involved in things of this world. Don't go after the things of this world. Be ready. Do not you do not be left behind. And so a lot of the Christian movies also were on that same theme. Left behind, tribulation, you know, the great tribulation and all of that. And so um, what I'm trying to say is, again, sure, we have to have that rapture mindset. We have to have a mindset that, in the Lord can come like tonight, like a thief in the night, as the scriptures say. But I love what Gle Billy Graham famously said, you know, I live as though the Lord is coming you know, next week, but plan for a thousand years. So plan for a hundred years. Uh, and that's a, there's a lot of wisdom there in that, in that statement, right? We have this attitude of readiness, the posture of readiness, but at the same time, we have a vision. And we, we are, we are uh, keeping ourselves busy building the kingdom and seeking the kingdom. And what does that mean? Uh, at the end of the day, Jesus paid the ultimate price, not just to give us a free, get us a free ticket to heaven. He paid the ultimate price uh, to take us back to the garden again. There's a beautiful song that I would uh, probably next session I'll play for you. It's a beautiful song by Jonathan Helser. Most of you know Jonathan Helser. The man, uh, you know, who, who who wrote the song and 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 uh, released that beautiful song. No longer slaves. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a sa a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And so he he released an, another song before that, and the song was basically um, titled "The Reward." It's a beautiful song, and that and that song, the lyrics in that song go. But the cross has made a way for us to enter in. The cross has made a way for us to enter in, to go back to the garden once again. 
In other words, the cross has made a way for us to go back to the garden. Which garden is he referring to? What Adam, what Adam and Eve had, which was intimacy, but also what Adam and Eve had in the garden was dominion. So now you will understand this quote all the more. Religion prepares man to leave the earth. What's happened over time is, over the centuries, the Christian message or the message of churchianity is Jesus is coming soon. Uh, you know, give give your heart to, heart to the Lord, pray the sinner's prayer, and get ready to be beamed up anytime, right? And so what's happened, unfortunately, because of preaching, because of a lot of other messaging, because the message of the kingdom or the gospel of the kingdom has not been front and center, everyone has subscribed to that mindset, that religious mindset. Oh, we just have to be ready. We have to be prayerful. We have to be ready for the rapture. And oh, yes, avoid the world. Be separate from the world. Stay away from the world. Stay away from people. People are, are trouble. Stay away, stay away, stay away. Be separate from the world. Be separate. And so unfortunately, what's happened is people have gone, have gone uh, uh, to the other extreme, not realizing that the Lord himself wants us to go into all the world, right? And he wants us to reach people. He loved people. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It doesn't say God so loved the church. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? And so the kingdom mindset prepares us, prepares man, prepares you and me as believers to dominate earth. Dominate not with a, not with a sword, not with, not with uh, violence, but to dominate with as army of God lovers, as army of laid down lovers, as army as an army of Christ lovers, you know. So um, it's it's a very different mindset from the religious mindset where we are trying to avoid people, be separate from people, and and not associate with people. Unfortunately, that is the kind of mindset that Jesus came to confront. He came to confront. The, the 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 Israelite Jewish mindset of the day, which didn't want anything to do with uh, uh, the non-Jews, right? In fact, people were sh shocked and stunned that Jesus was actually um, reaching out to and taking the gospel to uh, the non-Jews, right? So that's something that's something to uh, to think about uh, as well. That what is it that we have been believing in terms of the purpose of the church. What is, what is it that we have been believing in terms of the mindset that that uh, we have been cultivating it's from the day that we got saved, from the day that we got baptized? What is the mindset that you have been carrying and cultivating? Right. So I want to challenge you or ask you that question first. The other point I want to make is that in Jesus, as you see, he's going from city to city. And it says that he was going even in the synagogues and he was proclaiming and preaching. Which gospel? Not the gospel of salvation, not the gospel of healing, not the gospel of this, that, and the other, but he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, right? This is very interesting, right? And then after preaching that gospel, he was healing every kind of sickness and disease. I would like to propose to you that if we are preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, we will see healing and uh, diseases disappear. We will see healing break out in a profound way if we get back to preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, this is Matthew 9, and see what he does in Matthew 10. He tells the disciples to preach. As you go, preach. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the message he wants the disciples to preach, and that's the message that he preached as well. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. And again, the scripture that most of us are familiar with, Matthew chapter 6, but seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Now, here's the thing. Um, we often read the scripture as seek first church attendance. Now, I can tell you as somebody who served in a mega church for the first 10 years of my Christian life, four days a week, every week for 10 years, without fail, serving in multiple ministries and multiple capacities in a mega church. I can tell you that I often interpreted this as seek first church attendance. All right. You can be in church seven days a week. That does not mean that you're seeking the kingdom of God. You can be in church seven days a week. I'll say it again. That does not mean you're seeking the kingdom of God. Now, a kingdom 
like is like a nation. We are in a kingdom right now. You're on. You've come into this call. You're in a kingdom right now, and every kingdom has laws. Every kingdom has uh, citizens. Every kingdom has, and every one of the citizens in that kingdom enjoys certain citizenship benefits. Okay, and those citizens they know their rights. They know what they what benefits they can avail of, right? A citizen in America and a citizen in India, a citizen in Europe, in one of the European countries, a citizen in the UK. All these citizens are aware of the citizenship benefits that they can avail and enjoy. A lot of people try to want to migrate to some of these other nations and countries because they know that if they are able to get that passport, that green card, that citizenship they will be entitled to some citizenship benefits what jesus is saying here is seek first the kingdom of god seek first to enter seek first to enter that kingdom and how do we enter only through jesus no other way there's no other way by which we can enter that kingdom except through jesus because he's the king of that kingdom okay and his righteousness what does that mean we're not trusting in our righteousness we are trusting in his righteousness for access to that kingdom but once we have access we also need to understand how that kingdom functions and operates, right? The laws in different kingdoms on this planet are different. In the same way, the laws in the kingdom of God are different. So we need to understand, wait a minute, hold on. How does this kingdom operate? Because it's not enough to know about how church operates, right? The problem with us is most of us as believers, I think I include myself in that. We spend the first decade or more of our Christian life learning more about how church operates and operates and how church functions, but not about how the kingdom of God operates and how the kingdom functions. And every kingdom has an economy. So if there if there's a kingdom and if you're being called and invited to seek the kingdom, that means we also need to recognize that a kingdom has an economy. And so how does this economy in God's kingdom operate? That's another question we need to ask ourselves. Have you missed that? Right. To, I'm just going to make my case further here that when you see in Mark chapter one, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he, what did he say? What are the first words that he spoke? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. Gospel of what? Not the gospel of salvation, although that's a part of the gospel of the kingdom. He's saying Repent and believe in the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, here's the problem. Most of us believe in Jesus as Savior. Some believe Jesus is Lord. But most of us have not fully understood that he is the king of the kingdom that he's inviting us to. He's the king of the kingdom that, where he's actually made us citizens. And we are entitled to some citizenship benefits. And we, and we are being invited to understand and discover how this kingdom works and operates how we can then avail some citizenship benefits. And as children of the king, how we can walk in the inheritance that he's purchased for us. The word repent, again, if I want to come to the original Greek meaning of the word repent, is change the way you think. In other words, change the way he's telling the people. And again, he's telling, talking to the Israelites. He's talking to the, the people of Israel. He's speaking to the Pharisees. He's challenging everyone in Israel. Change the way you think believe in the gospel of the kingdom. In other words, he's telling these people who had memorized entire books of the Old Testament, who were people of the law, who were followers of Moses, he's telling them, who, who these people who prided themselves, who prided themselves as being children of Abraham, he's challenging them and he's telling them, hello, wake up, wake up, change the way you think, Believe in the gospel. Which gospel? The gospel of the kingdom of God. Okay, very interesting. He goes on to say in Luke chapter 4, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. If I ask any one of you, what was the purpose for which Jesus was sent? We will give all sorts of answers and good answers. But this is interesting that Jesus is saying this, right? For what purpose was he sent? He's saying, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also. For I was sent for this purpose, for this purpose, for this purpose. And now he goes on to say, soon afterwards, he began going around from one city 
and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. Moving on further. Uh, I spoke, I've spoken about this before. I'm asking the question again. My first question to you was, what is the gospel of the kingdom? And have you been, have you been uh, subscribing to the gospel of salvation or the gospel of the kingdom? Because they're different. Number, but the, first, the other question before that, do you have a kingdom mindset or do you have more of a church mindset or churchianity mindset? Moving to this question right now, how can we be the church that Jesus intended, the church that we see in the book of Acts in a post-pandemic, post-COVID world? Because what happened during COVID? Churches were shut down. Everyone was, was stuck in their homes for more than a year and everyone was primarily using Zoom. And that was the first wake-up call that our church systems and church structures are not fluid enough and not ready for, a, for something like a pandemic, right? Not only that, we, well, many of us, after the pandemic uh, kind of ceased or, or wore off, everyone post-pandemic wanted to go back to the way things were in 2019, not realizing that the pandemic was an invitation. It was an opportunity to rediscover uh, the church that Jesus intended, to rediscover how the church was in the book of Acts. If I can move on here, the biggest challenge to you and I is this, to follow the shepherd, not the herd. Because what was the herd doing? If we are going to follow the herd, we're going to just uh, not use our minds and just follow uh, what others are doing, which may not really see much fruit. We may not see much fruit as a result. And if we don't see the fruit, what we'll do is we'll end up becoming bitter sometimes towards the herd or towards towards the Lord. But then is, is the herd to blame? I don't think when we stand before the Lord on the day of judgment, we can blame anyone else. If we do not see the kind of output and the kind of fruit and the kind of results that we want to see in our lives, when we stand before the Lord on the day of judgment, we can't blame the herd. We can't blame any other pastor or whoever or leader uh, we have to blame and uh, point the finger at ourselves that were we really following the shepherd or were we following uh, the herd? Were we following a man um, and were we placing the words of a pastor or a man above the word of God, above the shepherd? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. And so what I want to propose to you is the church has left the building. In fact, the church left the building in the book of Acts. Uh, they were not. They were not meeting in the synagogues. The synagogues were a, were a hostile place for the church. In fact, for the first four hundred years of church history, the church was meeting in homes and caves, meeting underground. And you see this in scripture. I have the verses there up on the screen for you, right? Uh, the church has left the building, and what's happened in all these centuries gone by, especially in the last century, the last few centuries, last two centuries. We have all been wanting to go back to the building again, whereas the Lord has been sending us away from the building for the large, large, longest time in church history. The Lord has been sending us away from the building and we have been trying to go back and hide in the building. I repeat the word hide because that's what the building has become more often than not. It's become a hiding place, a place where we hide from the world, right? Not a place where we prepare, but a place where we just camp and hide. And I will, I will address this next week as well, about why that is something that the Lord is against, right? And how he, how he confronted that hiding, camping mentality, even with the disciples. I'll talk, I'll make the case for that next week, right? And so from the, you see it in the book of Acts and all the scriptures that I've shared with you on the screen, the Lord is all about the house. He's all about leaving the central building structure and moving into homes, moving into the house. Um, how am I justifying this all the more further is if you look at the state of the world, even this is the, the persecution map of most of the world. You have Central America, you have most of Africa, the entire Middle East and Far East Asia, India. Uh, you have entire places where there are even blasphemy laws that, have, that are enforced as well. Uh, pastors are arrested on, on a weekly basis. You have churches that you have entire church communities that are actively persecuted where people cannot even proclaim the name of Jesus. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to tell you that the church has been largely underground. 
for the last many centuries in most of these countries that you're seeing on the map. There are 200 million Christians who are living under persecution. There are 200 million Christians who are not able to gather in a fancy church building. They are still meeting underground like they were in the book of Acts. So what's the problem? The problem is that there is this westernized version of church that has infiltrated certain affluent parts of the world. There's this westernized church, a version of church where unless there's an air-conditioned building with a pulpit, with a projector, with some microphones, with some uh, uh, musical instruments and so on, it's not church. But I want to propose to you that for the vast percentage of the population on the earth today, they are gathering like the book of Acts, house to house. They are gathering in caves. They're gathering underground. They're gathering in secret and they cannot even make noise because they cannot afford to draw attention to themselves. They worship in whispers. They worship in silence. They worship in all these. They worship and pray in secret in all these places around the world, um, in soundproofed places, in soundproofed homes, in soundproofed rooms, in, sound, in, in house to house. So what am I trying to say again is this, that we tend to, we, we have tried to, and we tend to subscribe to, certain versions and certain expressions of church, um, not realizing that the church that God intended, the church that we see in the book of Acts is very different from the church that many of us aspire to be. So what is the church that God wants? What is the church that God desires? What is the church that God is looking for? Uh, if we think, if you're on this call, and if you think that God is pleased with every church, you're sadly mistaken. Um, I want to challenge you to read the first three chapters in the book of Revelation. If you read the first three chapters in the book of Revelation, you will see that out of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, which are situated in different parts of the world um, that, that the Lord is speaking to, he only commends two churches and actually rebukes and warns five out of the seven churches uh, in, in, the, in the book of Revelation, which only goes to suggest that he doesn't applaud and he's not, he's not applauding the 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 uh, leadership or the or the believers in every single church in the world is not he is there are things that please him and there are things that do not please him right and he's looking for repentance he's looking for a certain renewal of thinking he's looking for a, a people a company of people who want to align themselves with his heart for the world and with his heart for people he wants, he's looking for people who would align themselves with his kingdom. So we are all ambassadors of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter five talks about, uh, chapter four and five talks about us being a new creation, but also talks about us being ambassadors. Now, if we are ambassadors, you will understand that an ambassador is a person who's, rep who's representing another country, another kingdom. So as ambassadors of Christ in this world, we are representing another kingdom. We're representing our great king. And so our thoughts uh, have to align with the thoughts of our king and our kingdom. If you look at any other ambassador on this planet, let's say the ambassador of the Philippines or ambassador of India, they have to, their statements have to align with that of their government. Their statements have to align with their, with the leadership and with the kingdom that they are representing. Right? Even though geographically they may be in the Middle East or in the UAE, the governor or, or, the, or the ambassador to the, of, of the Philippines to uh, the Middle East has to speak on behalf of that kingdom and has to, his language has to align with the kingdom and with the king of that kingdom. I hope I'm making sense here. So we as ambassadors, what are we saying? What are we thinking? Is our thinking aligned with the king? Is our thinking aligned with the king that we are representing, with the kingdom that we are representing? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. If you are not, then we need, we need to really repent and change the way we, we think. Our thinking around church, our thinking around the purpose of church, our thinking around what is it to be a Christian, our thinking around what is your purpose, my purpose as a believer, as a Christian. What is our role? What is our purpose? I want to present a video to you from Graham Cook, and then I uh, will continue my conversation with you on this. How many of you know that the church is not a building? The church was never meant to be a building. 
It's a kingdom of believers practicing love and grace on each other. The church is the showcase for life in Christ. And it creates an expression of the love, the grace, the joy, and the kindness of God's nature. The church is also the agent of the kingdom on earth. It creates partnerships of mutual worth and value based on a shared vision that combines personal dreams that God has for all his people with the focus and plans for the corporate man of the church across the city or the region. We train people to fulfill God's dream for their life. We create action plans to mentor and equip people into their place in the kingdom. We create the same focus that Jesus developed in the gospel. He discipled his team and evangelized the people by attracting them to the kingdom of heaven. So the church is a vibrant kingdom community is a powerful key to unlock the world around us so that they may access the kingdom in a direct and dynamic way. It's a community that is strong on real friendship, compassionate love with grace, and passionate togetherness in acts of loving kindness. And that creates a viable place for everyone to taste and see that God is good. The church operates as the visual aid to the world regarding what God is really, really like in himself. At the same time, it demonstrates the power of the kingdom to bring God's passion, intention, and power to focus in real life situations for communities and nations. Our job here on earth is to create the same conditions that exist in heaven on earth as it is in heaven is our job description that means we as people are tracking with the goodness the glory and the majesty of god and demonstrating his love in the earth what does that look like in your life it could be something as simple as giving someone your seat on the bus or caring for a loved one or helping an elderly neighbor to mow their lawn or volunteering your time in the community, giving a smile and an encouraging word. It could be creating viable projects and agencies focusing on helping the poor, the unemployed or sick people. Also empowering favor and creative expression in business, education and the arts. We are the church. It's not a building. It never was. And to celebrate this, I'd love to invite you to participate with us this month by telling us your story of being the church or how you experienced someone else being the church to you. Simply make a video or write a testimony. Publish it to your social media channel of choice and hashtag it, we the church, so we can all see and share in those stories together. I hope you'll join us. All right. So the point is, the church was never a building. And so um, another thought, another beautiful video that I will share with you next week is um, a wonderful video from Francis Chan. It's an interview or a talk that he gave at the offices of Facebook. He was invited to speak at the offices of Facebook. And the, and the video that he shared uh, or the video or the recording of his message at, at Facebook went viral and it was titled Why I Left My Mega Church. And so I will talk about this next week. It's a very fascinating talk. Uh, for those of you who know, Francis Chan uh, founded this founded a church that started in his home, but then it grew eventually. And over a period of a decade or more, it increased to somewhere between 5,000 to 7,000 members. And um, he had a, a, a real reckoning um, you know, uh, some time ago uh, when he realized that his church, his mega church, was spending more money on the building and, and, uh, not really, and his church didn't really resemble the Book of Acts. He was very convicted by the fact, he was convicted for years, that his church did, was not resembling the Book of Acts and that most of the money and the, and the resources was being used on the maintenance of the building and that all the people who were coming to his building 
to the services were coming to see him and his gift on display, but they were not using their gifts to change the city, to transform the city. Poverty, the levels of poverty in his in the city was the same. The homelessness was the same. The gang violence was the same. Nothing was changing in his city, in his region. His church had grown, but the city had remained the same and the city hadn't changed. And that really convicted him. And that really bothered him. Now, how come? How come my church is not resembling the book of Acts? Something is wrong. Something is horribly wrong. And that entire journey of, um, of just ex examining himself and the scriptures and everything led him to step down from the mega church that he started. And he started another ministry called We Are Church, which is basically a house church movement um, that, that uh, has a vision of reaching a million people, a vision of a hundred a thousand house churches around the globe. He had a vision of having a hundred thousand churches around the globe with each house church reaching 10, 10, 10 people each. And so with hundred thousand churches, house churches, each reaching 10 people each, it would mean that a million people would be, would be reached. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a profound, profound vision, but I will share that video with you next week. I will not do that today for the sake of time. Uh, moving ahead. I want to challenge you with a thought. Most of us have spent our Christian life like this. We have spent our Christian life, at least I definitely did, doing, uh, keeping myself busy with a lot of activity, being a hamster on a hamster wheel, right? Um, because again, a, tra a trap that most of us fall into that if we are busy, if we are doing a lot of work, uh, in a church building or involved in a lot of Christian activity, that means that we are uh, growing or that means that we are building and seeking the kingdom of God. That means we are maturing, not necessarily, not necessarily. And that was an epiphany that I had to, uh, that, that happened for me 10 years ago, uh, right? And it, it through a series of events, which included me, uh, uh, I, me and my wife both not having a job for more than a year and us having to uh, move out of church because of our visa situation, move out of the city because of our visa situations and being without a job for more than a year. It was all of those situations, situations like that, situations, circumstances where we saw widows, uh, uh, widows who uh, before they were widowed, husband, wife serving in a church for more than a decade. And then the husband suddenly passes away from a heart attack after a church service. And that all the church has to offer that dear widow is a prayer, nothing more than a prayer, no financial support, no assistance for her uh, to take care of her children. And eventually this tithe giving, a uh, diligent tithe giving uh, uh, person has to take her children and relocate and leave the city. And the only thing the church had to offer her was a prayer. A lot of in series of incidents like that, series of moments like that got me thinking that something is wrong. Uh, we've spent most of our Christian life being this hamster in the hamster wheel, doing a lot of activity, but not really making progress, involved in a lot of Christian activity, involved making ourselves very busy in church attendance four times a week, like me maybe, but not really growing, not really, not really having much fruit, not really even receiving deep healing. Uh, staying, carrying the same wounds and pains for more than a decade, not really receiving healing, so, not really growing, not really increasing. Number two, this so, one and And so I want to talk about this further, all right? When I talk about growth, I'm also talking about something else. I'm not just talking about Christian activity. I'm also talking about our uh, awareness, right? So one of the biggest challenges, again, in churchianity, in the church systems is because there is not much of a kingdom mindset, you will not hear much scriptures or much teachings on money, where Jesus himself spoke more about money than any other subject. He spoke out more about money than, the, than prayer or any other topic you can think about. The, the Old Testament and the New Testament contains altogether more than 2,000 references to the subject of, on the subject of money. Yet the only scriptures you will hear about in church are about uh, the love of money is root of all evil, which is what Paul told Timothy. And you will hear about the scriptures on tithes without fail week after week, but you will not hear anything else on the rest. And that's a problem, right? Um, I, 
I may have shared this quote with you earlier. I'm going to repeat it again uh, by Professor Howard Snyder. Why? What's the problem, right? When you do not have a kingdom mindset, it affects what you will be preaching and, and what you'll be hearing on a weekly basis, right? If leaders don't have a kingdom mindset, if pastors don't have a kingdom mindset. Why? Because kingdom people, as you can see here, he's saying this profound statement, Professor Howard Snyder, He's dropping a bomb here. Kingdom people seek first the kingdom of God and its justice. Church people often put church work above the concerns of justice, mercy, and truth. Church people think about how to get people into the church. Kingdom people think about how to get the church into the world. Church people worry that the world might change the church. Kingdom people work to see the church change the world, right? And so we'll talk more about this as we go along. We want to, people who are people of the kingdom, they want to see an end to sex trafficking. They want to see an end to human trafficking. They want to see us an end to abuse of people, abuse of labor, right? There are things that really uh, um, kingdom people want to see change. Whereas church people are just happy to be in the church building, pray about things, not take any risk, just pray about things and just wait for rapture. That's a significant difference between a kingdom, uh, a company of people versus church-oriented people. I'm going to read some quotes from Graham Cook, which are really profound, and I hope you will get something from this as well, right? Why, why are we talking about this subject of the kingdom so much? I like what he's saying here, Prophet Graham Cook. The church is on a collision course with kingdom right now. It's not about how... Can we fit the kingdom into what we are doing? Forget that, forget that, forget that. God is going to expand, expand, expand our understanding of the kingdom and then stretch everything that we do as a community so that we fit everything that heaven wants to do here on earth. I love this quote. I love this. Jesus only mentioned the word church two or three times in scripture, but mentioned the kingdom almost 80 times. 80, 80 times. He clearly, Jesus clearly wanted to keep our understanding of the church as fluid as possible. Ecclesia, the Greek word for church, means more than just a simple gathering. It can also mean a company of called out people. We are a committed band of people meeting together for a common purpose. Church is not a place we go to. It is who we are together. Church is not a place we go to. It's who we are together. Again, Graham Cook making some strong statements here. I believe the enemy has penetrated the church. He couldn't beat it, so he penetrated it. We have to separate ourselves from any ideology or doctrine or theology that is not in line with the absolute good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and that does not represent the beauty the majesty, the fullness, the abundance of what God is really, really like in his nature. Do you know more about how the church operates than how God works? Do you know more about how the church operates than how God works? The kingdom is everything. And if you're building church without a context for the kingdom, you're doing it the wrong way. The church cannot manifest the kingdom. The church actually comes through the kingdom and is an expression of that kingdom. Powerful, powerful quotes here worth thinking about, right? I love this as well. He, get, he, makes it, he gets more blunt here. We will find out the real from the false. We will find out the real from the false. We'll find out who is committed to kingdom and who is just committed to their own empire. Every time you build church without a sense of kingdom attached to it, if you don't put kingdom first, you're building something just for yourself. You're building something just for yourself. And this is a powerful message to pastors and leaders all over the world. What are we building? What are we really committed to? I love this quote by Pastor Ashish Raichur. For those of you who know us, you know that we have been talking about this book uh, for years. We have, we have actually distributed hundreds and hundreds of copies of this book. Um, over the last decade. And this is a book that I read for the first time uh, 11 years ago, and it completely challenged the way I do life and ministry. And the book 
has this is a quote that I've taken from the book from um, by by Pastor Ashish Raichur, and he's someone we really look up to. We had the honor of hosting him in Dubai a few times, but I wanted to share this with you. If there is one thing absolutely necessary in Christian ministry today, it is the developing of a kingdom mindset. God has not called us. God has not called us to build our own ministries or even our own churches. He has called us to build his kingdom. Discover what it means to be a co-worker with the king. Develop the heart of a kingdom builder. Learn how to partner in kingdom building. Kingdom building is about building people. Kingdom building is about building people. If we all work as kingdom builders, we will see a radical shift in the spiritual dynamics within the body of Christ in any city, any region, any nation. Um, I have a wonderful, wonderful videos on, on the subject in, in Q&A sessions that I've done with Pastor Ashish. I'm happy to share those recordings with you as well, where I have a deep conversation on the subject with him. And I can share those recordings with you later as well. But I want to make a final point before we go into the lesson for today. This whole concept of servant leadership, this whole concept of leaders being servants, this whole concept where Jesus said that whoever wants to be the greatest has to be the servant of all. This concept of where leaders act as servants and then act as masters. This whole concept of servant leadership can only thrive in an environment and a culture that is uncompromisingly kingdom-centric and not church-centric. Why am I saying that? Because if a, if a environment, if a culture of a, of a ministry is entirely church-centric, then what happens is the growth of the church becomes the most important thing, not the growth of the kingdom. And when the growth of the church becomes the most important thing, then you will start viewing, uh, viewing or seeing other churches as competition as opposed to seeing them as co-laborers in Christ. When the growth of the church becomes the most important thing and not the growth of the kingdom, then what happens then also is you will start seeing people as your servants. You will, not, you will not treat people like sons and daughters. You will start treating your congregation members as servants who are there to serve you and who are there to serve your vision, who are there to serve you and your ministry. You will not be looking at people as, okay, how can I serve them? How can I help them fulfill their vision? How can I help them fulfill their calling for their lives? You will not, you will not have that mindset right? A kingdom mindset is a mindset that says, okay, how can I be a blessing to this person? How can I propel this person to fulfill their, their call in the kingdom? Whereas a church mindset is, okay, how can I use this person to build my church? How can I use this person to build my ministry? It's a very, very different, different thought process, very different thought process. The church mindset wants to use people for church ministry, whereas the kingdom mindset wants to empower people, equip people, release people for kingdom purposes, right? So that's a very, very different thought process, right? In a church culture, in a church-centric culture, uh, the, the mindset is the person has to keep coming to that building and has to be in that building and not in the world. Whereas the kingdom mindset is, okay, you may be in this building, you may be in this, in this place, but the whole goal of you being here is not just to be camped here. Your goal is to be equipped, empowered, uh, healed, delivered, strengthened to go out there and be salt and light and have maximum kingdom impact during your short time on planet Earth, right? So that you can hear, hear the king say one day, well done, you've been a good steward of time, you've been a good steward of resources. You've been a good steward of the gifts that I've given you, right? And so a church-centric mindset is, is very different from a kingdom-centric mindset. A church-centric leadership mindset is a very different from a kingdom-centric leadership mindset, right? A church-centric leader will always want you to know about the church and will try to teach you about being a good church member, a good, a good church uh, attendee. Uh, uh, any, even any concept of serving is limited to just serving in the church, setting up chairs in church or whatever, right? But a kingdom-centric leader, a kingdom-centric uh, minister will not look at you that way. 
they will not want to use you for their ministry or their church. They will always look at you, okay, how can I equip you? How can I be a blessing to you so that you can have maximum impact for the kingdom so that you can fulfill God's call upon your life so that you can fulfill the kingdom purpose, the pur God's purpose for you uh, for the sake of the kingdom during your time on this earth, whether that no matter what that looks like, whether that means starting a business, whether that means, uh, you know, starting a, starting another ministry for children or uh, doing something in the nonprofit space with an orphanage, whatever it is, whatever that looks like, right? A kingdom-centric leader doesn't care whether you are coming and just, you know, uh, being in a, in a building week after week, four days a week playing church, a kingdom-centric leader is all about kingdom impact and equipping you for kingdom impact. And so I want to present to you that um, this is an invitation to you to be a kingdom citizen. The whole purpose of, this, of these sessions is to invite you to be a kingdom citizen, to discover what the citizenship benefits are, to go on this journey with us to understand how the kingdom of God operates and just not be satisfied with just to know how a church operates and how church functions. Enough of that, you know enough of that. But this is an invitation to you to discover and pursue and go on this journey to seek the kingdom, to seek to understand how the kingdom operates, to seek to understand the kingdom economy, how the kingdom economy functions, and how you can benefit, um, and how you can uh, make the most of the kingdom citizenship benefits that you have. So I don't want to uh, take any more time here. Without further ado, I want to go into the lesson for today. Uh